moaning deeply, heart shattered by his great love. In spite of all, he obeys the God's commands. And back he goes to his ships. People who are really upset and, and, and hold it against Aeneas forget that this is first and foremost not an entertainment text, not for the Romans, not for Virgil. This is a religious text, and he shows proper respect to the gods, right? Now, the obvious question is, if he knew he was going to leave for Italy all along, then why did he mess around with Dido and break her heart? That's a different question. That is a legitimate question, though, isn't it, right? Well, uh, we get then this notion of all of the men are leaving the city of Carthage out to the boats they go. It's an amazing word picture. You can see them streaming out of the whole city. Men like ants that, weary of winter's onset, pillage some huge pile of wheat to store away in their grange, and their army's long black line goes marching through the fields. This will not be the last time that Roman legions will be equated with ants amassing. Um, and, and here it is, right? We're, we're told at line um, 5, 12, Virgil steps in as the voice in the po as the poet's voice, and he asks this question. What did you feel then, Dido, seeing this? This you usage we saw in both the Iliad and the Odyssey. Every once in a while, the poet speaks directly to one of the characters, and here it is, Dido. What did you feel then? By the way, notice, Dido feels, Aeneas obeys, right? How deep were the groans you uttered, great gazing now from the city heights to watch the broad beaches seething with action, the bay, a chaos of outcries right before your eyes. How did you feel when you saw all those people leaving, including your lover Aeneas? And then Virgil says it um, at line uh, 518, love you, tyrant, Virgil says, to what extremes won't you compel our hearts? And then we're told, again, Dido resorts to tears, driven to move the man or try with pairs, a supplicant kneeling, humbling her pride to passion. So if die she must, she'll leave no way untried. That is to say, she calls in Anna. So we began with Anna, we end with Anna at the end of the book. She, she calls in Anna and she says, listen, you got to go and talk to him. You have to plead with him. We've got more questions that she asks. Why does he shut his pitiless ears to my appeals? Where is he rushing now? If only he would offer one last gift to the wretched queen who loves him, line 540, to wait for fair winds, smooth sailing for his flight. In other words, just hold off, just hold off. That's going to be a request. I no longer beg for the long lost marriage he betrayed, nor would I ask him now to desert his kingdom. No, his lovely passion, Latium. All I ask is time, blank time, some rest from frenzy, breathing room, till my fate can teach my beaten spirit how to grieve. I beg him, pity your sister, Anna. One last favor, and if he grants it now, I'll pay him back with interest when I die. In other words, I'm, I'm willing to give him Carthage if he'll just stick around. He can run off and form and, and make his own little a new Troy. I'm just begging that he would stick around. So Dido pleads. And so her desolate sister takes him the tale of tears. Again and again, we're told. But no tears move Aeneas now. He's deaf to all appeals. He won't relent. The fates bar the way, and heaven blocks his gentle human ears. And then we get this amazing epic simile at the end of Book 4. As firm as a sturdy oak, grown tough with age, when the north winds blasting off the Alps compete, fighting left and right to wrench it from the earth, and the winds scream, and the trunk shudders, its leafy crest showers across the ground, but it clings firm to its rock, its roots stretching as deep into the dark world below as its crown goes towering toward the gales of heaven. So, that's again these epic symbols, how they work, as so, right? So firm the hero stands, the hero. Buffeted left and right by storms of appeals, he takes the full force of love and suffering deep in his great heart. His will stands unmoved. The falling tears are futile. The falling tears, of course, scholars have debated. Are we talking about the tears of Anna? By proxy, of course, Dido's tears. Are we talking about Aeneas' tears? It's very possible that Aeneas is crying tears here, but he's got a sense of duty, right? Then... We're told, terrified by her fate, tragic Dido prays for death. She has all these terrible signs that are pointing that something terrible is about to happen for her, right? Um, we, now from the depths, line uh, 578 uh, um, or so. Now from its depths, she seemed to catch her husband, dead husband, Sikius' voice. The words of her dead husband calling out her name. While night enclosed the earth in its dark shroud, and over and over it, Lonely owl, line 580. A lonely owl perched on the hill, on the rooftops, 
drew out its low, throaty call to a long, wailing dirge. The owl, of course, not only the bird of wisdom, but often the bird of death, right? And worse yet, the grim predictions of ancient seers keep terrifying her now with fear, with frightful warnings. Aeneas, the hunter, savage in all her nightmares, drives her mad with panic. She always feels alone. Notice that she, like Aeneas earlier, was alone. Now she's alone. Abandoned, always wandering down some endless road, not a friend in sight, seeking her own Phoenicians in some godforsaken land. And then we get some interesting similes that tell us that Virgil wants his audience to be reminded. The Greeks did this before I did this. As frantic as Pentheus, seeing battalions of furies. We think about Euripides' Bacchae. Twin suns ablaze and double cities of Thebes before his eyes. Or Agamemnon's Orestes, Aeschylus' third play of the Oresteia trilogy, The Furies, hounded off the stage, fleeing his mother armed with torches, black snakes while blocking the doorway, coil her furies of revenge. We're told so, driven by madness. We think of, of course, all of those tragic characters of Shakespeare, especially Ophelia, driven by madness, beaten down by anguish, Dido was fixed on dying, working out in her mind the means, the moment. In other words, she knows suicide is coming now. It's just a question of how. She goes to Anna. She lies. She gives her a plan. She says, I think I got a, I think I got a plan. Let's go to a witch and try and figure out a way. If I can't convince him, maybe the witch can help me to forget him. Right? I'm going to use magic. She says, now go. Line 618. Build me a pyre in secret, deep inside our courtyard under the open sky. Pile it high with his arms, Aeneas' arms. We're back to the arms of, the, of arms of the man I sing, right? He left them hanging within our bridal chamber, the traitor, so devout, so devoted then. And all his clothes, and crowning it all, the bridal bed that brought me, that brought my doom. In other words, I'm going to burn everything. I'm going to burn it. I must obliterate every trace of the man, the curse. And the priestess shows the way. Anna doesn't realize that this is, of course, the beginnings of the end for the suicide. There's flowers strewn, right? Dido, of course, knows the future. Her hair is loose in the wind. We have all the different aspects of magic that are being told here. One foot free of its sandal in line 648, right? She calls on the gods to witness. She says her prayers. We're told everybody's sleeping but Dido. Later we'll be told Aeneas is sleeping. Then we have this amazing soliloquy, right? Where she's going to speak out loud. And the question is, what is it that I should do? I'm at line 667 or so. What is it that I should do? Make a mockery of myself and go back to my old suitors, number one. Can't do that. Go sailing with Aeneas, not like they're going to let him do that. Chase after Aeneas with my own troops, can't do that. Or the fourth option, 683. No, no, she's thinking out loud. Die. You deserve it. End your pain with a sword. Um, this is significant because these kinds of soliloquies, like we find here, these are really the birth of Shakespeare's soliloquies, right? I mean, when we see Shakespeare's greatest soliloquies, to be or not to be, comes to mind, and of course, ironically, it is a, it is a soliloquy that at least considers the old notion of to die, to sleep, suicide, and all of that. They're all born here in this amazing passage, right? Of course, she's aware if only I'd been free to live my life untested in marriage, free of guilt as some wild beast untouched by pains like these. She says, I broke the faith I swore to the ashes of, uh, of Zacchaeus. In other words, she says, I'm getting what I deserve because I promised my dead husband Zacchaeus I would never again go after a man. And I did. We're told such terrible grief kept breaking from her heart as Aeneas slept in peace on his ship's high stern. Aeneas is sleeping while Dido is going absolutely insane. Mercury is sent from Jupiter, and he says, what is going on? Son of the goddess at line uh, 700 or so. Can you sleep so soundly in such a crisis? Can't you see the dangers closing around you? Now, madman, can't you hear the west wind ruffling to speed you on? That woman spawns her plots, mulling over some desperate outrage in her heart. We think of Medea, don't we, of course, and, 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 and all of that, right? Lashing her surging rate, she's bent on death. Why not fleeing headlong? Flee headlong while you can. You'll soon see the waves of chaos of ships, lethal torches flaring, the whole coast ablaze. In other words, she's going she's gonna to bring all those guys, and we're going to have war here if you don't get out of here. If now a new dawn breaks and finds you still malingering on these shores, up with you now, enough delay. And then the famous line for a 710. Woman's a thing that's always changing. 
shifting like the wind. With that, Mercury vanishes into the black night. Well, this idea of, well, you can never trust a woman, well, raises the more interesting question. Wait a minute. She's pretty steadfast. It's Aeneas who's the fact, the one that's going to leave. The ironies run deep, right? Aeneas says, let's go. Um, um, we follow you. He says, blessed God, it's 720. Off you go. He cuts the lines that in, in, instead of pulling them in, he just cuts them with his sword. Obviously, his symbolism is clear here, right? And his dawn breaks at 730. The queen from her high tower catching sight of the morning's white glare, the armada heading out. She sees it all. She calls for fire. She's ready to attack them. And then she says, what am I saying? At line 743. Where am I? Again, another soliloquy. Beautiful, brilliant. What insanity, insanity is this that shifts my fixed resolve? Dido, oh poor fool. It's not only now, is it not, is it only now your wicked work strikes home? It should have then, when you offered him your scepter, look at his hand clasp, look at his good faith now, that man who they say carries his father's gods, who stooped his shoulder, his father bent with age, couldn't, in other words, she's doubting some of the story that maybe he even told, couldn't I have seized him then, ripped him to pieces, scattered them in the sea, and we think about Medea here, or slashed his men with steel, butchered Ascanius, served him up as his father's feast. True, the luck of battle might have been at risk. Well, risk away. Whom did I have to fear? I was about to die. I should have torched their camp and flooded their decks with, flat, with fire. The son, the father, the whole Trojan line. I should have wiped them out, then hurled myself on the pyre, pyre to crown it all. That is to say, what was I thinking? I should have just destroyed him right from the start. She prays to the gods. She curses Aeneas at six uh, at six um, uh, six sixty eight or so. She says, "Let him be plagued in war by a nation proud in arms, torn from his borders, wrenched from Elias's embrace. Let him grovel for help and watch his people die a shameful death. And then, once he's bowed down to an unjust peace, may he never enjoy his realm and the light he yearns for." Never. Let him die before his day, unburied on some desolate beach. In other words, I hope what happens to him is what he told me happened to Priam, a corpse without a head, right? That is my prayer, my final cry. I pour it out with my own lifeblood. And you, my Tyrians, hurry with hatred, all is line, his race to come. In other words, harry them always to fight. This is the source of Virgil's understanding of why we have to have these three Punic Wars, why Cato always finished every one of his famous speeches by destroy Carthage. No love between our peoples, ever. No pacts of peace. And of course, this pacts of peace will take us back, won't it, to the Iliad, and more particularly to the famous killing uh, of uh, Achilles, um, uh, um, uh, of killing of Hector by Achilles, when you'll remember Hector said, can we please, you know, have some kind of accord? And Achilles says, no talk of peace, no peace pacts of any kind, right? Come, she says, rising up from my bones, you avenger, still unknown. We obviously think of Hannibal when she says this, right? To stalk those Trojan settlers, hunt with fire and iron, now or in time to come, whenever the power is yours. Shore clash with shore, sea against sea, and sword against sword. This is my curse. War between all our peoples, all their children, endless war. Of course, the Romans would understand that this might have been what she requested, but the Romans took care of business after the third, what we call Punic Wars, right? And that was the end of Carthage. Explains to some degree, Virgil helps us to understand that rage that the Romans feel towards the Car Carthaginians after they destroy it, finally at the end of the third Punic War. They just destroy even the soil, so you can't grow anything by dumping salt and everything in it, right? She speaks to her nurse. She is ready to commit suicide. The suicide seat begins at roughly uh, 800. Dido, trembling, desperate now with a monstrous thing afoot, her bloodshot eyes rolling, quivering cheeks blotched and pale with imminent death, goes bursting through the doors to the inner courtyard, clamors in frenzy up the soaring pyre and unsheathes the sword, a Trojan sword she once sought as a gift, but not for such an end. And Nech, catching sight of the Trojans' clothes and the bed they knew by heart, delaying a moment for tears for memory's sake, the queen lay down and spoke her final words. So here she is, ready to kill herself, and, 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 and then into the pyre she will go, with Aeneas's sword, in fact, and these are her final words, at line, at line um, eight, uh, oh, 808, 809. 
Oh, she says, dear relics, dear as long as fate and the gods allowed, receive my spirit and set me free of pain. I've lived a life. What, a, what an amazing life. I've lived a life. I've journeyed, this is of course her odyssey, right? I've journeyed through the course that fortune charted for me and now I pass through the world below. My ghost in all its glory. We're going to pick up with her in book six. I have founded a noble city, seen my ramparts rise. I've avenged my husband, punished my blood brother, our mortal foe. Happy all too happy I would have been if only the Trojan keels had never grazed our coast. She presses her face in the bed and cries out, I shall die unavenged, but die I will. So, dash, so, dash. Of course, we're to understand this is now she's stabbing herself, right? I rejoice to make my way among the shades, and may that heartless garden far at sea drink down deep the sight of our fires here and bear with him this omen of our death. Notice it's not my death, it's our death. At line 830, we're told rumor is going to rave now through homes. The heavens echo back the Keening Den for all the world as if enemies stormed the walls. In other words, in the same way that in Book 2 we had the storming of Troy, here we have the fall of a different kind of Troy. And all of Carthage or old Tyre were toppling down in flames in their fury, wave on mounting wave or billowing over the roofs of men and gods. This is brilliant poetry. I just want to impress upon you. Virgil is in his highest form here, it seems to me, although we'll say the same thing when we meet, uh, it, it meet again in book six. Anna immediately knows. She has all these questions that are always asked, of course, about suicides. How could you do this to me? You deserted me. What shall I grieve for first? She says, your friend, your sister, you scorn me now in death. You should have called me on to do the same fate. In other words, why, why, why did you do this alone? I would have done this with you. Um, and, and then, just to think, she says, I built your pyre with my own hands, implored our father's gods with my own voice, only to be cut off from you. How very cool, cruel, when you lay down to die. You've destroyed your life, my sister, mine too. And of course, we always go back to this, don't we, when we talk about how tragic suicide is, not only for those who kill their cells, take their life, but for all, the, all those who are left behind. Three times, we're told, Dido looks up, trying to see the sky as she's writhing on her bed. Her death is a painful one, right? Um, then we're told Juno, finally at 863, in her power, filled with pity for Dido's agonizing death, her labor long and hard, sped Iris down from Olympus to release her spirit, wrestling now in a death lock with her limbs, since she was dying a death not fated or deserved, no, tormented before her day in a blaze of passion, uh, Prospera um, had yet to pluck, uh, Persephone had yet to pluck a golden lock from her head and commit her life to the sticks in the dark world below because she's so young, she's not supposed to go yet. So Iris, glistening dew, comes skimming down from the sky on gilded wings, trailing showers iridescent, shimmering into the sun, hovering over Dida's head, declares, so commanded, I take this lock as a sacred gift to the god of death and I release you from your body. With that, final lines, she cut the lock with her hand and all at once, the warmth slipped away, the life dissolved in the winds. And that's the end of it. Um, the opening lines, by the way, of Book 5, all the while Aeneas stealed, Aeneas stealed for a mid-sea passage, held the fleet on course, well on their way now, plowing the waves, blown dark by a north wind. As he glanced back at the walls of Carthage, set aglow by the fires of tragic Dido's pyre. In other words, he moves on. In the same way that he had to leave Creusa, he has to leave Dido, and off he goes to found Rome. And of course, we'll get there at the end of the poem, right? Or at least gesturing there. Okay, so that's the poem. Uh, that, that, that's the uh, tragic uh, uh, play. And let's now work at level two and three. At 2A, well, let's, I mean, let's say the obvious, it gets dark at night, right? Love is great, but it's also, I mean, it's destructive, isn't it, right? It is a fire. That's why we say it's falling in love. Right? Of course, we'll also point out that this book suggests that relationships are kind of like Troy. They can fall, even though they seem really strong. Of course, we can quote Hamlet in his lines to Ophelia in the play Hamlet Act 3. Believe none of us, he says. We are errant knaves all. That is to say, guys, guys can be liars. 
The other side of this, though, is another message. Sometimes reason has to be more important than passion. Certainly when we get to Plato's Republic and we study Plato's Republic, we're going to hear from Plato that that's going to be the tripartite soul. Reason has to govern emotion and desire. We might say sometimes a great leader, and even as we've used the word here, a hero, has to use reason to overcome passion, right? That's the, to, to the two warring elements of, you could argue, all of the Indian. At level 2b, the symbolism, well, it's fairly obvious, right? Dido is symbolic of the jilted lover. Aeneas is symbolic of the hero, or some will see him as the villain who leaves the girl. The fall of Dido is obviously symbolic as the fall of Troy was. The ironies abound. I mean, let's just mention a few. Dido knew all along, because, I mean, Aeneas said it in his story, that he had to leave, and yet somehow she couldn't believe it. That's that notion that the young lady who is with the guy and all of her friends are saying, he is going to destroy you, blow you up, jack your life, and she won't listen. And then once it happens, she's like, how could I not have seen it? This will as well, and this is part of that ironic uh, twist as well, this will explain why Rome and the West will always be suspicious of anything in the East, Carthage and Africa. That is to say, Cleopatra first with Julius Caesar and then finally, most significantly, with Mark Anthony. In 3A, well, the Iliad, I mean, think about that one. Obviously, you got Hector who will leave his Andromache when she's begging him not to. In the Odyssey, we will have Agamemnon who will say, you can't trust women, and here it will be Virgil's Dido that says, you can't trust men, the age of faith is over. Think about in Aeneid 2, the Trojan horse, and the motif of the Trojan horse, and then think about the ways in which Dido sees Aeneas as, in fact, the very same. We've already mentioned the Greek tragedies. We will study a number of them, but here really is the Roman tragedy, no question. It's not a play, it's a poem. Soon, of course, it will become Shakespeare and his plays, and then later novels. We're going to see this motif over and over again in our study of AP English, though, where you're going to have, a, and often it will be, a, a woman who has complete and total trust in her man, and then her man turns around and blows her up. It, by the way, it will work the other way as well, as so many bad country songs like to remind us, right? Just kidding. I like country music too, right?